1996, after this brief message. Over shocking, the story bizarre. Actress Margot Kidder, missing for several days, had been found, dazed and dirty, hiding in the bushes of a stranger's backyard. As she was taken off to the mental ward of a Los Angeles hospital, everybody asked, what had brought her so low? Well, tonight, for the first time, you'll hear Margot Kidder's dramatic story as she reveals a lifelong and devastating secret to Barbara. Yes, Hugh. You know, at one time, Margot Kidder was one of Canada's most famous and highest paid actresses. Her sexy looks and her feisty attitude had led to a string of 47 films. Her most famous role, of course, was that of Lois Lane opposite Christopher Reeve in the Superman films of the 70s and 80s. To the world, she was a movie star. But the reality was very different. Her private life was often strange, almost incomprehensible. This interview is the first time I've ever talked about it publicly. And the last few months is really the first time, with the exception of very few people in my life, I've ever talked about it at all. Because the terror of being called crazy is so extreme. Margot Kidder, now 47, has a lifelong secret, an illness called manic depression or bipolar disorder. It is genetic, often inherited, and characterized by dramatic changes in mood and behavior. In a manic state, people are energetic, excitable, sometimes delusional. They need little or no sleep. In the depressed state, they feel hopeless, sometimes suicidal. Two and a half million people in this country are manic depressives. It is what Margot Kidder has lived with since she was an adolescent growing up in Canada. Bonafide stardom arrived when she was cast in Superman. Easy, miss. I've got you. you you've got me? Who's got you? Margot Kidder was a perfect Lois Lane to Christopher Reeve's Man of Steel, and they soared together through four films in the 70s and 80s. Then her career seemed to fade. No one knew quite why. In 1990, she had an automobile accident, which led to a serious back injury. Medical bills resulted in her filing for bankruptcy. Her only child is Maggie, now 20, from her first marriage. There were two other marriages, none lasting more than 18 months. Margot Kidder has tried to keep working, although the parts are fewer and the films far from blockbusters. In 1995, she made Young Ivanhoe, soon to be released on video. The same year, she appeared on stage with Stacy Keach in Stieglitz Loves O'Keefe. But last April, she made the kind of headlines she never would have wanted. After a three-day police search, she turned up cowering in a stranger's backyard, her hair chopped off, her front teeth missing. She's crazy. She's finished, people said. So this is really home. This is home. And I'm Margot Kidder now calls Montana home. It's where she lived in the 70s and where her daughter was born. Hi. Look who's here. We talked at the log cabin she shares with her dogs, Zelda and Kendall. After 30 years of secrets and hiding, she was ready to talk openly and for the first time about the mental illness that has ravaged her life. To friends old and new, she is not Margot, but Margie. Margie, what everyone wants to know first, how are you feeling? I feel very good, very good. Much humbled and very good. Yeah. When did you start having mood swings? Well, you know, I found, in fact, about a month ago, an interview I'd given when I was 19 to a magazine in Canada in which I said, I have mood swings that knock over entire cities. Mm. But at that point, I don't know how much psychiatrists knew about manic depression. I know that I didn't know what to call it. Um, it wasn't my mood swings that alarmed me as much as the altered states that I would go into. I liken them to uh, LSD trips without the LSD. Describe. Uh, it's a tough one. Sometimes they're wonderful. Sometimes I go soaring up into a place of this incredible illumination and wonder. And other times the terror of knowing that you are going to a place that is considered mad, and that is mad, let's face it, it is crazy, it is mad, the terror of what is happening to you, the panic that sets in and the trying to control the mind and the trying to hide what's happening to other people. The hiding is the killer. How did you hide? I hid by taking drugs. I hid by getting drunk. I hid by literally hiding in my house and not going out and not picking up the phone. 
I hid by all manner of deceit in the same way that a gay man would hide his gayness before he was able to come out of the closet. And the hiding has taken such an extraordinary toll uh, as much as the illness itself. Well, there's a huge stigma, and I think until you have the, an illness like this, you have no idea what the stigma is and the extent of it and how incapacitating it can be. Dr. Kay Jamieson, professor of psychiatry at Johns Hopkins Medical School, is an expert on manic depression. She has written three books on the subject. In the most recent and unquiet mind, she admitted her own struggle with the disease. You can be so-called normal and live just fine and then have these episodes that are considered crazy. Absolutely. There's, and it happens all the time, every day of the week. Um, you, long periods of insanity and long periods of depression and debilitating depression. People can show up for work and still look reasonably okay. Uh, not when they're manic, but certainly when they're depressed. Do you or did you feel the attacks coming on? Are there warning signs? Well, yes. Now that I've finally got to a place where I can accept it, that in fact there are a lot of signs that if I were watching I could read for. For instance, what kind of signs? Well, uh, in I get more manic than depressed. I get really manic. You get up rather than down. Woo! I get way up, really fast, where you find your brain just starts to get a little faster and a little faster and you're talking a lot. I mean, these extraordinarily bizarre leaps in the mind that start to happen. And accompanying the leaps in the mind is a physical you get really revved up. You stop needing to sleep. You stop sleeping, essentially. Which makes it worse. Well, it makes it much worse, yeah. How often do these kinds of ups or downs happen? I can pretty safely say that the big episodes where I was really in major trouble and had to either be hidden by friends or hospitalized were about two to three years apart. Have you been suicidal? Oh, yes. I don't think anyone gets to have manic depression without being suicidal. I, it never occurred to me I would make it to this age. I just always assumed I'd have killed myself by suicide, so I didn't plan for the future. <laughs> have you actually attempted suicide? Yeah, my first suicide attempt was 14. My second suicide oh, attempt okay. was, I guess, at 21. Did you take pills? Did you try to slit your wrist? Did you, what did you do? The first time I took pills, the second time I slit my wrist, yeah. And you were, someone found you and obviously and saved you. The big shock was I got in the tub and trimmed the razor blade and it really hurt and it almost shocked me out of it. I don't, it's a little comical, but it's what happened. Maggie, how did you bring up your child during all of this? How did you bring Maggie up? Well, she's pretty terrific. Um, I mean, what has saved me is my daughter. But the reality was it, it has had um, not a lasting effect on her, but it was uh, uh, dreadful for her. I mean, mommy suddenly goes up there to the sky and thinks she's found God and comes down. And of course, probably mommy's given all her money away or spent it all because when you're in that place, it doesn't really mean anything. And there's a little child going, where's my mom? Where's my mom? Maggie Kern, Margot's daughter, well, is married to a writer and lives in Livingston, Montana, not far from her mother's cabin. Maggie told us much of her childhood was wonderful, but many of the memories are of very strange behavior. So suddenly there would be lots of projects going on in the house, and the projects would get more and more bizarre. It was as though someone had put her on fast forward, and there was no logic behind it. And this is when you were a child, mother would have these episodes. Yes. What did you think? My biggest fear was people finding out. People would say I, to you, I, mother's crazy? Yes. I mean, and since then, people say it all the time. What? That my mother's crazy. My mother's a lunatic. And she's not. And people who have this are not crazy. They're ill. She never stopped loving me, which still blows my mind. Um, uh, and I loved her, which was equally important. When you were making Superman, were you okay? I was okay for long stretches of time, and then there were pieces of time where I definitely wasn't okay. There was one time when we were in the south of France, and I knew I was wigging right out there, and I ran from my hotel room in the middle of the night to a hospital, and they locked me up, and I had to escape uh, with some fellow who actually put me in a laundry hamper. Um, and I got back to everyone, but I had by then a big stash of downers. I lived on tranquilizers for a long time. Christopher Reeve said he didn't know. 
Well, I think there were times where you knew something was wrong. Mm -hmm. Christopher and I had a couple of periods where we had a lot of snippy fights, and a lot of it was because I was in a space that he didn't comprehend. Um, and we have to sit down and hash all that out and get a lot of giggles out of it in the future at some point. The drinking you did, the excessive mm -hmm. drinking, and the drugs. Right. Was that to cover up the disease, or was it? Uh, well, sometimes it was just to party, which yeah. I've never regretted a okay. good party. But let me um, give you an example of how that works, and maybe it'll uh, clarify it to you. Three years ago, I was on a movie set. I was sitting there going, I'm going. It's starting to happen. And just the panic, my heart, I mean, just talking about my heart goes. My heart started to pound, and at lunch, I got to my trailer and downed some downers. And by evening, I was really panicked. So the margaritas started to go down. So instead of people saying, Margot Kidder is ill. They said, Margot Kidder's a drunk boy. She drinks too much. Yeah. She takes, you know, yeah. she boozes and she drugs and anything. Which I'd almost rather have. Or ha would have almost rather have. Sure. I mean, mental illness is the last taboo. It's the one uh, that scares everyone to death. Uh, and I have to include myself in that until the last few months. When we come back, the dramatic episode that finally exposed Margot Kidder. At the age of 47, Margot Kidder is a liberated woman, freed from the burden of a devastating secret, the truth about her manic depression, exposed after a shocking episode last spring. It made front page news across the country. Margot Kidder, missing for five days, had been found in a most degrading condition, wandering aimlessly in a delusional state. Margot Kidder's journey into delusion took her from the L.A. airport to a suburban backyard. She ended up disheveled and dirty in a stranger's clothes, some teeth missing, looking like the homeless people who she says helped her survive. Now she can add this recent episode of manic depressive illness to the book she is writing, which she has titled Calamities. Let's take the events mm -hmm. last April. Mm -hmm. Did you feel this attack coming on? Maggie noticed it coming on, and Maggie had told me about a month before, Mom, you're manic. I'm very aware of when she falls into a manic bout, when she's beginning the slide. Uh, the energy level is increased. Uh, the, her speech is different. Her body movement is different. Uh, I got farther up and farther up and was writing furiously and not sleeping, and then a virus somehow got in my computer and erased three years' worth of work. And when they told me a lot of it couldn't be recovered, that was the moment I realized in Reconstruction I flipped into delusion. She was supposed to go to a speaking engagement, and she flew to Los Angeles on her way. And it became obvious after a day or two that she was missing. I was on the phone to everybody, calling every, finding old phone books, going into her cabin and listening to old phone tapes. To see where she might have gone. To see where she might have gone. And, you know, finally asking the LAPD to check the morgues. What do you remember? I remember every second of it. You do? I thought that I'd gotten a note warning me that I was in dire danger, and it all had to do with this book. It was very complicated, and that somehow my ex-husband was in the CIA. It turns out it's the most common delusion, the CIA ones. Um, other people get to fly to the moon, I get stuck with the CIA. Manic depression causes delusions and hallucinations, and probably the most common kind of delusion that manic depression causes is paranoid delusions, where people feel that someone is out to get them, someone is after them, there may be a conspiracy, people may feel that there's an agency out after them. I thought I had to, I thought I had to be blown up. Somebody was out to get you and they were going to blow you up? Well, I had to die in order to save my daughter and my sister. I went to the airport about the second day in of the delusion, trying to escape, and there were two young men who got off the plane who were clearly just going, woo, who is this one? <laughs> and uh, I tried to convince them um, that they had to help me, that you know people were after me and I had to get out of the airport. You see, one of the rules of my delusion was that I couldn't tell anyone it was the CIA or Maggie would get hurt. After you got out of the airport, you wear a dental plate and you lost it. Do you know how you lost it? <laughs> The teeth part of the story gets ridiculous, and everybody who knew me 
as this teeth part was spread <laughs> around the world, burst out laughing. I had some terribly bad dental work done years and years ago. And for years have, every time something's fallen out, which they do frequently, stuck them in with super glue. And when you're having a paranoid delusion being chased by the CIA, you don't take your super glue. And so as these various things happened and the teeth went, yes. Um, <laughs> so, no, I didn't lie there and pull them out, as, as reported. Maggie, you hitchhiked. At one point, you swapped clothes with someone. Mm -hmm. I, I walked, mostly. I walked uh, almost 40 miles. What did you do for money? What did you do for food? Well, there's a community of people, um, the homeless people downtown, absolutely took care of me. And this lovely guy, whose name was Charlie, who I'd love to find and thank, said, you've been very confused. And he took me back to his little cardboard home. And on the way there, I tried to crack a joke and say, look, I don't know how to behave. I'm not from this kind of neighborhood. And he just looked me right in the eye and he said, none of us are from here. Mm. And I went, Phew. And he took all the blankets he had and covered me up. And he just held me. I met some of the most terrific people I've ever known. And I was in worse shape than them. I was talking into what I thought was a bug in my shirt. Um, I did trade clothes. My main sense of tragedy about this last event is that there's somebody downtown with my best Armani suit. Oh. <laughs> Only Armani suit. This beautiful black suit that I loved so much. Why did you chop your hair off? People did on the street. A couple of people recognized me, and it put me in a state of absolute panic. Did you say to anyone, I'm Margot Kidder? Oh, good grief, no. No. Finally, after three days, how many days were you away? Five. Five. You were spotted in the backyard of a home in Glendale. Why were you there? Well, actually, I had decided at that point that I didn't want to be homeless downtown, and it was about 85 degrees, and I hadn't eaten, and I was exhausted. So I lay down in this woman's, uh, it was actually a pile of leaves, and she, too, was wonderful uh, and, and very sweet and said, almost apologetically, I'm afraid I'm going to have to call the police. And I went, oh, that's fine. Don't worry. The tabloids were the first to call. And tabloids were the first to call. And, and they don't tell you why they're calling, because they want you to give them information. And you know, my husband was just screaming into the phone, is she alive? You know, eventually, the police called. And, but it, it was horrifying. And it was a horrible way for anyone to have to go through something as painful. Margot Kidder says the Glendale police were very kind when they brought her to the psychiatric ward of the local hospital. A few days later, she went to Canada to be with her family and met a woman who treated her with acupuncture and she says wise counsel. But she had not been using any medication. Lithium, the most common treatment for controlling manic depression, is effective 70% of the time. You know that lithium is what is usually given mm -hmm. to manic depressives, the, the drug lithium, right. and that it stabilizes them. You do not take lithium. I tried lithium. Uh, my stint on lithium was so deeply unpleasant, uh, and I feel as if I had all the side effects, um, that it would be a toss-up if I had to choose between the, what I felt like on that drug and going crazy every two years. I think I might choose the crazy. Uh, Dr. Jameson mm -hmm. and other doctors uh, tell us there are alternatives to lithium. There are mm -hmm. other drugs. Will you try them? Yes, I start my Depakote next week. That's so an alternative to lithium. That's, it's an anti-seizure uh, medication, which seems to work with far fewer side effects. If you continue to take the drugs, it wouldn't just be a year or so. You could live the rest of your life if, if mm -hmm. it works, mm -hmm. <laughs> as it usually does with people when it's diagnosed and carefully supervised, right? right? Yeah. yeah. Going outside to smoke a pack of cigarettes. Call me when you're ready to act. Anxious to put that very public episode of last spring behind her, Margot was working again as a guest star in a new series, Boston Common. In Montana, she's working on her book, spending time with friends and leading a pretty normal life. If you believed recent tabloid reports that Margot Kidder has run off to the mountains and become a recluse, you'd be very wrong. Human beings make other human beings better, and that's all there is to it, with love and acceptance. And my secret was out, and people still love me, and I couldn't believe it. Maggie, why did you want to do this interview? Uh, I needed to do this interview. I needed to put this incident 
behind me and move forward with this new acceptance and awareness and admittance of my mental illness. For me to sit here and say to you, I'm Margie and I have a mental illness that's called manic depression is the biggest step I've taken in my life and I so don't want to cry. <laughs> I so don't want to cry. But it's the thing I have avoided and been terrified by uh, and have demonized my whole life. Uh, and it has done extraordinary damage to an awful lot of lives besides mine. I'm 47 now. I've had an awful lot of highs. And they were great. But the price I pay for them is pretty tough uh, to accept. And I'm not, I can't pay that price anymore. It is possible to come back, isn't it? Oh, she has well, very much yeah. come back. She said she was going to start a new medication now. How is she doing on it? She's taking a, a Depakote, and she seems to be doing all right. She's on this uh, sitcom. They've asked her to come back. She thought nobody would ever ask her to, uh, to, to give her a job again. They tell her they want her to come back in a reoccurring role, and she's very happy. So she, if she keeps taking this medication and it works, she's stabilized. Yeah. What is her frame of mind now? Well, she wrote me a letter, and, and we have talked since then, and she said, this is important. She said, please tell everyone. In general, I've been blessed with a wonderful life. Every human being is given some sort of burden in life and mine happens to be manic depression it is no heavier burden than anyone else's and it is lighter than many it is simply the card I drew and she doesn't know this and she doesn't remember this but when I interviewed Christopher Reeve Christopher Reeve I, talked about the I card that he drew he these are brave people and uh, if you're watching thank you Margie great thank you Barbara well next